Buongiorno everyone, and welcome to my YouTube video series, What Makes It a Masterpiece. Today's masterpiece is the double portrait of the Duke and Duchess of Urbino, which was painted by the great Tuscan painter, Piero della Francesca, around the year 1474, and which hangs in the Uffizi Gallery in Florence, Italy. And the first thing that makes this masterpiece a masterpiece is the fact that it is a portrait. And let's admit it, we are picture people. We love to take pictures of ourselves and of other people. So whenever we see a painting of a person, we're always fascinated by it. And this portrait is one of the first portraits of the Renaissance. Now consider that for most of the Middle Ages, portraiture had disappeared as a genre of painting. And the reason is because medieval society would find it proud and arrogant of you to have your image reproduced for posterity. But in the Renaissance, when all things Greek and Roman came back into fashion, so too did the love of portraiture. So this is one of the first portraits that we've seen in about a thousand years in Renaissance Europe. The second reason this painting is a masterpiece is because of the composition of the portrait. You notice that the sitters are in strict profile seen from the side, and they are painted to the bottoms of their chests, or what we call bust length portrait. And the reason they look like this is because Renaissance artists were looking at ancient Roman coins, and that is usually how the emperors appeared on those coins. So this was a position of power. And consider that this is how Renaissance portraits would look until a very famous artist by the name of Leonardo da Vinci came along and changed the game by turning the subjects of his portraits to a three-quarter frontal position and to elongating them all the way down to their waists, or what we call half-length portraits. All you need to do is to imagine the Mona Lisa to get an idea of what I'm talking about, but we'll talk about her in another episode. Notice how the sitter is composed so that the head is against the sky and the body is against the earth. And this is a reflection of the Renaissance philosophy of mens sana in corpore sano healthy mind in a healthy body. And so the head is backed by the sky, which is the ethereal, the body instead backed by the landscape or the earth, which is the corporeal, which is the physical. In fact, a lot of people like to think about this artist, Piero della Francesca, as sort of a forerunner to Leonardo da Vinci, because he was a mathematician as well as being a painter. In fact, the third reason this painting is a masterpiece is because of the artistic skill or virtuosity, which keeps coming up in these videos, that Piero employed in painting it. So if you look at the Duke, you'll notice the wrinkles around his eyes. You'll notice those wisps of hair up against the blue sky. You'll also notice this dark beard that's visible through his skin. It's almost photorealistic, or as close as you're gonna get in the late 15th century. And the fourth reason it's a masterpiece, and let's be honest, is because of the funny looking nose on the Duke. In fact, it's probably the most celebrated facial mutilation in the history of art. The Duke was not only missing the bridge of his nose, he was also missing his right eye and most of the right hand side of his face because he was injured quite badly in a joust where a lance came through his helmet, tore off the top of his nose and removed most of the right hand side of his face. So I always say that luckily for him, portraits were done in profile at this time because that is his only side. You may have also noticed a pretty stark resemblance to the French actor Jean Reno. Fifth reason it's a masterpiece is because of the Duchess. In fact, if you're wondering what the cover of a Vogue magazine looked like in the late 15th century, here you go. Now the Duchess would not be the cover model. She's not that beautiful, but she does embody everything that feminine fashion was at the time. Starting with the hair color, which is supposed to be blonde. Now you don't see too many natural blondes running around the Mediterranean today, and there weren't any more back then. It was very common for aristocratic women to bleach their hair. And the most commonly used bleaching agent was horse urine. 
Notice the high brow of the Duchess. Very common for women to pluck their brows so they could get that hairline higher. They thought longer faces on women were more beautiful and foreheads were considered sexy. And that blanched skin that you see. So it was very common for aristocratic women to avoid the sun because it made you look more aristocratic. And the cosmetics that they used to blanch their skins were usually lead and or arsenic based cosmetics. And that leads me into the sixth reason that this painting is a masterpiece. Because believe it or not, this is a posthumous portrait of the Duchess. She had died a couple of years earlier, but not from intoxication or poisoning. She actually died from complications at childbirth, and she died at the ripe old age of 26 and one half years of age. And that put her right into the statistical norm where about 50% of women died by the time they reached the age of 30 from complications at childbirth. The point being that the Renaissance for men and the Renaissance for women were two different things, and this painting reflects that in a very iconic way. In fact, if you flip the painting over, if you go to the back side, you'll see these allegorical images of the Duke and Duchess also reflecting what their roles were in society. The Duke dressed in armor, being drawn on a triumphal chariot by these magnificent white chargers, accompanied by the four cardinal virtues of justice, prudence, fortitude, and wisdom. Whereas the Duchess is drawn on a triumphal chariot pulled by unicorns. In fact, unicorns are the symbols of virginity because the belief was that only virgins could draw unicorns to them. So her job was to remain chaste and virtuous until she found the right man with whom to share herself. In fact, the painting was once a diptych. It was attached on a hinge and was closed, almost sort of like a portrait cameo, and then opened up. And so technically what we consider the back of the painting was the outside as well. Okay, so with that, I'll wrap things up. And if you like what you saw, please subscribe to my YouTube channel or give me a like, and you'll find other links to my podcasts and videos in the description below.